starting. Hi, I'm James McGuire, editor of Datamation, and our topic today is the future of data storage, the future of software-defined storage. To talk about that, I'm joined by a top thought leader in the sector. With us is Vincent Sue, Chief Technical Officer for Storage and Software-Defined Environments at IBM. Hey, Vincent, how are you doing today? Pretty good, thank you, James. And uh, you are there in sunny Tucson, correct? Correct. Very warm yes, weather. I know, you, I, I know you get around. You're in Chicago. You're in the Bay Area. So you, you, you're putting a lot of miles early this year. Seriously. Yes. Yes. I mean, it's always exciting. So I, I know that uh, you know we talked beforehand. We decided to throw out all the convers all, all the all the questions and just like start anew, which I appreciate that. Like this. this so I think that the idea is cognitive capabilities, which is interesting because you, know, you think about the classic data center. We've got these vast reservoirs, but sometimes these, these are some dumb machines sitting there just holding the, the, holding the data. We want to do more with the data than merely store it. The question is, you know, cognitive capabilities. How, how is cognitive capabilities really transforming the IT process in your view? Yeah, so James, first, first of all, what, what, what is cognitive capability? Let's be really clear. What do you mean when you say cognitive capabilities? Yeah, cognitive capabilities, the ability to, uh, I think the, uh, the fundamental desire, the fundamental objectives is to be able to um, uh, precisely capture the insight of the data. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, as you know, that people are collecting data, you know, people are collecting more and more data, right? Data is growing the exponential rate. This was true 10 years ago, it's even truer now. The problem is, how do you turn that huge amount of digital assets into insight that you can leverage for your advantage? And in the past, the people has really relatively uh, sort of deterministic algorithms, right? Mm -hmm. And how do you, well, if, uh, for example, that we talk about uh, uh, data securities and those are all quite deterministic, but we, we start to realize that the world is a lot more complicated, that we need the, the more intelligence, artificial intelligence capability to help us to analyze those data and to extract the right values and correlate those information. That's even harder. With all this information, what data is related to what information and create the new information, create the new values from the combination of those information. And those higher level capability we call the competence. Is that a series of tools, software tools, software in combination with hardware? What is the actual tool itself? Yes, they are. Uh, IBM has a significant, is significant understatements. Has a very significant investment on uh, the cognitive uh, software suite, like Watson Knowledge Studios and things like that. Right. But now we are integrating that capability with the infrastructures. So we allow that that the um, that the cognitive software to be able to. Uh, harvest the metadata of the system, uh, mm -hmm. of your data, and allow the user to be able to customize those data and be able to correlate those metadata to generate a new insight for you. For example, they can say that how often you touch the file, is, 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 uh, is this particular user has a right, has, the, has a abnormal access pattern of all those informations, et cetera, et cetera. So we can correlate all these information and create a new insight that people don't have it before. And this is very uh, exciting that we are, we are looking at how do we apply that in the life science? How do we correlate those research data? And we, we try to accelerate, help our, you know, the medical communities, how do we accelerate those uh, 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 medical research? Well, it's, it's, it's the same. It's like, uh, you know, per pervasive analytics. I mean, you want to like just, you know, not just store the data. You want, you, you want to constantly be, you know, understanding what the data means. And you want, you want analytics in all your various domains, your various devices. How, how, how does pervasive analytics tie into the idea? Yeah, this is a great term. I really like this term called pervasive analytics. The analytics is no longer just um, uh, very, very narrow defined. In the past, when people talk about big data, some people would define that, well, let's just do sort of map reduce kind of or, workloads, or right? Spark. Right. Spark. But yeah. no longer that's the case. I think that when we talk about, remember, we need the, the initiative of uh, the, the vision of a cognitive to be able to get the best insight from the data, the aggregate of data, correlation of the data. Then we need to be able to run analytics in, in, in lots of places. You cannot, uh, in the past that, you know, uh, as I say that, People think about big data, they load the big data, they load the data to the Hadoop clusters and run the HD uh, Hadoop uh, computations and get the data. 
those things are if the data become the data set become you know large, it's really difficult as a difficult thing to do. So what we do here is enable that people be able to run like Hadoop, be able to run Spark, be able to run a NoSQL database that across all data sources. Your data sources, object storage, no problem. We have a we have the accelerator allow you to have a 10x for a performance improvement to allow you to be able to run Spark on object storage. That in the past people has a perception that object storage is slow, and but if you are, if by far majority of your data is object storage, we need to find a way to allow you to be able to run your analytic capability function on it, and that's what we are working on. Our research team is working on right now. Is is there a name for that accelerator at this point, or is it still in in research? It's it's a research name. It will be a, a spark accelerator, but I'm not a marketing yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. executive here. I don't want to come up with a new name for them. No, we, we just call it Spark Super Fast. Uh, okay. Yeah, so, su Spark Super Highway, something like that. <laughs> yeah, just a short, a short tangent about Hadoop and Spark, and that seems like you know Hadoop really changed analytics in many ways, but it, it seems like a Spark is more on the upswing than Hadoop was because it's, it's perceived as Spark is so much faster than Hadoop. The, it's not so much Spark is faster. It's Hadoop really require you to load the data to the Hadoop clusters. You cannot, I mean, sure, right now, we, I mean, by the way, we start to enable Hadoop run on object storage. But up until now, the, pra the common practice, if you want to analyze a set of data, you load the data from whatever the data source you have, put on the Hadoop clusters, uh -huh. right? And that data, that process, you know, let's say it take, a few hours once you have a few terabytes. But once things go beyond petabytes or the, the job gonna run for like, you know, weeks a month, and that become a, a, a burden. I do, I'm a Spark doesn't have that. Spark doesn't, it sort of, it, it, it sort of break the paradigms for people to run the analytic on where the data is. And that's where the, uh, the enablement that we are, our research team is working on to allow people to be able to, um, you know, uh, be able to run, you know, sparks in any of their data sources. Mm -hmm. well, what about the idea of, you know, hybrid cloud? And it, it comes into, uh, you know, so the software defined storage. And I think, you know, software defined storage is sometimes siloed, partially because the idea of an entirely software defined data center is still somewhat of a futurist dream. But if you think about software defined storage in combination with the cloud, there's all sorts of possibilities there. I mean, for for, for the hybrid cloud. Where does that go for you? These, those things are not disconnected. The thing we talk about cognitive to pervasive analytics to hyper cloud, those are not disconnected. The reason uh, hyper cloud is important is given the I, from the original, uh, the, 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 the initial vision that I want to be able to harvest the insight from all my data, then my data is spread across uh, on prem, off prem, the cloud, the private cloud, then I need to have a federations allow me to be able to seamlessly operate my data center across all this, not just one particular cloud, not the particular on-prem technology. I want those technology to be um, to be working in harmony, if you will. Well, so I need does that tool exist? I guess that's what I if, if I want. I'm curious. Is that tool you just talked about that pervasive? Does that actually exist? That our I our I, my teams and our research team and partner to work on those federations to allow us to be able to uh, seamlessly uh, connecting the data from the on-prem data to off uh, to the cloud and be able to spin up the services on the cloud. Those things is coming, is coming. Okay. All, right, all right, so it's 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 on the horizon. Correct in the near future. Uh, what, what else about hybrid cloud and and, and pervasive? Uh, Computing. How, how, does, how does that work? Together? So the the thing is that uh, I think that I just want to bring up two more aspects of that. One is the, the workload management. Okay, when we right now we just talk about how we're gonna manage my data on the on-prem, uh, private cloud, public clouds, and the, you have to ask your questions: Is how does I distribute the workloads? Which workload in, can uh, which workload should be run at which cloud? is the most optimal solutions, mm -hmm. right? You don't want your workload running on uh, particular storage uh, platforms and the data is uh, in particular location, but the data is all far away, right? So you need to figure out the, how do you manage your workload to optimize your efficiencies, right? The second thing is providing the insight of now with all this cloud connected, the next question is, I get this question from my client a lot, a lot 
where exactly my data is. <laughs> and, right, and, and, it's hard to know. And I, I need to meet, I and mean, by the way, some uh, the IT data center need to be able to provide the metering of those, be able to provide the, the health check of those data, be provide, right. the, provide the data protection. So those things are two more important topics that, you know, when we open up these hybrid cloud capabilities. Yeah. You know, I, I want to get a, a further sense of where you think storage is going this year, but let, can I just do a, a, a little bit about Flash because uh, Flash may not be as exciting as some as futuristic as like you know pervasive computing, but it seems like Flash has had a number of years here on the upswing, either you know three to five years. Oh. I'm wondering. I mean, Flash is still extremely important. Well, that, I, I say I, I wonder if, if is Flash, in your view, has it kind of plateaued in, in, in terms of its adoption? Is it still on a rapid upswing? Okay, so I want to expand the definition of flash a little bit beyond Please. just the uh, NAND flash. Okay, I want to call that a solid state storage technology, right. including the NAND flash, including the phase change memory. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. phase change memory that allow us to have uh, like, you know, 10 times better, I mean, 100 times better endurance of the flash and sure it's more expensive, but has much lower latencies which will provide a next tier, will create a new tier between the DRAM and the fastest uh, flash storage. Mm -hmm. So we will see that happening. We will see the software-defined storage to take advantage of that uh, phase change memory capability, the storage class memory capabilities. Mm -hmm. On a flash, I, I, my prediction for this year is we are going to see the pervasive adoptions on more than, you know, in the past, you will talk about flash very focused on the OOTPs or workloads, uh, transitional workload, database kind of workloads. But we, w we are seeing this across the um, uh, adoptions on right. all kinds of different workloads from, you know. Across the, the whole storage tier. I mean, it used correct. to be just, yeah. Absolutely. Especially, I we believe in 2018 when the QLC, which is 4 bit per cells, I know when I say 4 bit per cell, may not be very, very sexy. It is. It is very sexy to see how what you open up the new opportunity when people start talking about a cold data. It's a very economic way to store the cold data, mm -hmm. right, right? right? So we'll open up even the object storage. And you know, uh, if you, you if you look at the problem not just purely from dollar per gigabyte perspective, you look at the overall how many people you need to uh, you need to how many people you need to uh, uh, invest to just managing the, the dry failure and stuff like that and right. changing that to all you know, solid state technology will have a, it's a game changer in terms of the, the TCO calculations. Right, I mean, people have been concerned because the price has been higher, but the price has fallen, so it seems like it's, you know, talking about pervasive, it's definitely not a way to be But we're talking about the, the, the sort of the big leap of the, the, the price reduction with the TLC this year is three bit per cells. Next year we'll see the four bit per cell and those are not, the, huge leap in terms of the densities and the huge leap in terms of the, the, the cost of those systems. Mm -hmm. what, what else about where, where data storage is going th this year? What, what, do you, what, what do you expect to, be, to happen to, to say in the next 12 to 24 months to be big in data storage and software defined storage? I think that, um, um, I think one of the big trends I will see is we don't look at the software defined storage in silos. Software-defined mm -hmm. storage and software-defined network, these tight integrations to allow to optimize uh, the infrastructures and the workload placements, those things work together, you will see the true benefit. Mm -hmm. I always and, uh, caution um, you know, my client that don't just try to solve one piece. You, know, you can have the best uh, software-defined storage, but, uh, but if you don't have a right workload management, uh, right network you know, integrations, you might not yield the, the best result that you would like. Right, right. Well, what, what else? I mean, something that just we were going to be totally surprised about. Oh my gosh, you know, that's going to happen <laughs> in data storage. Whether you, give, give us the secret, Vincent. Uh, just what, <laughs> like, you know, what, what, what's up? Yeah, what will I, be up? I think that, uh, let me go back to the first topic we talked about cognitive. We yeah, will, cognitive is big. We sure. will see the, the very creative way to use the cognitive capability, somebody called it artificial intelligence, to how do you completely change your, um, uh, your, your old process. For example, the security, right? As I said, in the past, when we determine security, it's kind of mechanical and kind of deterministic, right? 
you know, the right. right password, right IDs, or right encryption keys. But now you will see that people start to analyze your assets patterns, you analyze your uh, the IP address, analyze the correlation of data, and be able to you know truly protect your data, even from the people that has the right authority, if you will. Right. Right. So but that they can be some of the most dangerous people. Those people. Yeah. <laughs> so. Right. Right now, we are we see a lot of innovation there. Uh, you know, IBM Inside there. There's a lot of research in this area, and we is, we 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 spend a lot of time to work with our client to look at what is their what is their ultimate goal to protect their to protect their most important assets, and then how do they uh, what insight they are they they need to to create new value for them. And I think this is. I know this is not so much traditional storage speaking, but there are a lot of storage requirements. Uh, there are a lot of requirements laid on storage layer to support that. For example, if you want to do all these correlations, your storage need to be able to be able to be able to uh, be able to help the software, uh, cognitive software, to collect those metadata to manage the data efficiently. And right. there's a performance requirement. You don't want to analyze stuff that take take a long time to analyze it. You need to have a right uh, uh, sort of the storage technologies be able to facilitate the the demands on the on the performance, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. And you need to have a right infrastructure to be able to store them secure uh, security at the data availability. Because a lot of times when we were, remember I early on I talk about um, there are, there are a lot of value going to come from the correlation of the data, right? The data generate data, okay? Right, and, right. And, you, you you know you really those data need to be all available. You cannot just put the data, lock the data in in, in some mountains and and somewhere that you know those data all need to be available. And we need to be able to with real time correlate all this information to generate the best insight. And that is a grand challenge, and that's that has a lot of demand on the storage systems. That that is that is I think that is the future of storage right there. Yes. Yep. Yep. Uh, Vincent, I think you have said it. It's a, a, it's a lot of good stuff. I, I will send you the uh, the interview when it's done. We can we can tweet about it. But I think I, I really appreciate your expertise. Thanks for talking with us today. Well, thank you. I'm really excited. This is never a dull moment here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you. So.